Steps Personal Finance Podcast. Bringing personal finance to you step by step. This is episode six. It's great to be back and great to have you listening again. The audience figures for this podcast are growing by the day, so a big thank you to you for listening, and an even bigger thank you if you've put someone you know onto the podcast too. One more of us, one less of them. Last time we looked at getting the most of a simplified approach to your financial picture by utilising a a simple three-account approach. We can separate bill paying, discretionary spending and saving into three distinct buckets. We control the flow of money in and out of each bucket, making it work harder for us than it ever has and keeping our stress levels low, our need to monitor even lower and our peace of mind plentiful. It may even pay us to adopt this approach, thanks to the cashback current account on offer at the moment from Santander. So today, I want to take your control to the next level. I want to strike a major blow to all of those financial institutions and service providers who stand between you and the best deal. To anyone who ever took more than they should when you signed on the dotted line, who fooled you with a a clause hidden in the small print who made you pay a fee on technicality. We're going to strike back at them. And how are we going to do this? By being our own lender. That's right, I'm going to show you how you can be your own bank. Now, there are two versions of how this will go. The regular version and the extreme version. If you're someone who's listened to the last few episodes and thought, that doesn't apply to me, Whether that was because you have no debts or you have a regular income and living from a plan seems impossible, then this addresses you. Regardless of your income, whether it's 15,000 a year or 150,000, this will help you. So I've split my guidance into two versions and I'll probably regret that down the line, I know, but let me stick with it for now. So what's the regular version then? Well, first off, let me pick your brain for a second. Have you ever been offered interest-free credit? 0% interest on a washing machine or a three-piece suite or, dare I say it, a car? Of course you have. 0% interest is as good as free, right? Pay nothing now, pay for it later, no extra cost. That's one of the biggest marketing tools around. Am I saying it's a bad thing? Not necessarily, no. If you're efficient with your finances, in full control of your spending and so on and so on, then this is something that can be taken advantage of, sure. You could put the money you were going to spend into an account, earn a little interest and pay off the item with 0% credit. Sure you could. In fact, I've done that in the past. I bought some furniture when I just moved into my first home and even after receiving a discount for a fairly substantial order, I chose to buy the furniture as 0% interest over 12 months. 12 payments made from money I had set aside. After a year it was mine, no problems at all, and I'd made around £38 in interest by keeping the money in a cash ISA. So 0% interest free is the way to go, right? Well, not necessarily, like I said before. I got my old paperwork out for this episode and checked what would have happened if I hadn't kept to the 12 monthly payments. It said that I would have been liable to pay interest of 22.9% on the full original amount had I deviated from their repayment plan. Now, remember, I had the money sitting in an account, ready to pay this thing off. I also had my rainy day fund set aside of about five months of living expenses. So I had a good amount of insulation from bad luck. Well, had I lost my job or had a major emergency decimating my rainy day fund, it's possible that I may have dipped into this cash ISA money set to the side. I could have been forced to use that money to get by each month. The cost of doing that wouldn't have been missing out on £38 of interest. It would have been in the region of £650, as that was the interest penalty for the amount I'd borrowed. Had my financial situation been any less than it was, with rainy day fund in place and other savings, I wouldn't have dared to risk a potential £650 mistake for the possibility of making £38 in interest. And let me go even further here. Most people don't enter into 0% interest-free deals to make a little bit of interest on the side. They go into them with the thinking, 
not can I purchase it outright, but as can I afford the monthly payments? And that's really the problem here. 0% deals are so popular because it allows you to have something right now and not mean you have to have the full cost ready to pay now. And this worries me. It should worry everyone, but let me explain my fears with it. Firstly, the situation I outlined a moment ago. It's fine if you stick to the plan, but if you deviate at all, miss a payment for any reason, can't finish the monthly payments as outlined, then the fees are steep. The interest that can be tacked on or reinstated is in credit card territory. 18, 20, even 30% is possible. There may have been admin costs thrown in the mix too, to really heap on the pressure at a time when, I expect, you would already be struggling. So there's the possible risk of added costs to worry about. Secondly, it may be fair to say that if you can't afford to buy it outright, you can't afford to buy it on payments. Now a house is different. A mortgage is an acceptable debt because by the time you saved up enough to buy a house outright, you'd be so old you'd likely have forgotten where it was you were saving for. But let's say it's a fridge freezer, £300 now or £25 a month. What harm paying the £25 a month, right? Well, let's look at them. Could you not sell a few old items on eBay to raise 50 or £100, then save hard for a month or two to scratch together the other 200 If it wasn't an urgent requirement to replace your existing fridge, then maybe. Perhaps you could build the money up beforehand and buy it outright. Or you could risk the monthly payment and hope you don't get stung for a 20% interest penalty of £60 if something goes wrong along the way. In isolation, one monthly payment isn't too risky. What if we had one on for an oven though? And a nice new 4K TV and a dining table set and, and leather sofas. See where I'm going here? This is reasonably normal behaviour. It wouldn't be unheard of for a young couple to move in together and get lots of stuff on 0% deals to furnish their home together. If they add up all the little monthly payments, suddenly there's a decent portion of their income going towards these deals each month. And what about cars? A car payment may be the ultimate bad 0% deal. You might get to buy a shiny new motor off the forecourt and not get charged any interest on the money they lent you to do so. But that noise the car is making as it drives across the tarmac, that, that low hum, you know what that is? No, it's not the new hybrid engine. No, no, not, not the fuel injection. That's depreciation. That's the value of the car being left along the road as you drive down it. The AA says a new car will have lost 40% of its value after just one year. 60% after three years. So in fact, you're still paying £15,000 over five years, just 250 quid a month, on a car that is now worth 9000 this year and will be worth just 6000 in a couple more years. By the time the last payment is due, five years after buying it, the car will be worth maybe only four and a half grand. You can forgive me if I don't give you a round of applause for getting a good deal on the financing. Leasing HP interest-free, call it wherever you want, it's a bad deal. Now the situation with cars can get even worse. You know you have to insure yourself to drive the thing, so your first call after buying it is likely to an insurer. Thousand pounds a year to drive that lovely new, expensive shiny car. You can't afford to pay that, you couldn't afford to buy the car outright either, you could just afford the payments. So can I insure on payments? Absolutely you can, but this one doesn't come as interest-free 0%, I'm afraid. Don't worry about the details, though. We can understand your situation. Just pay us £100 a month and you're good to go. And there we have it. You're up and running. Does it matter that you're being charged 20% more to pay monthly instead of as a one-off? Not to most normal people. Fast forward five years. The same couple has lost ten grand on the value of a car they paid 15 for. They've overpaid their insurance company by £200 each year for the benefit of monthly payments. Their car has lost them £11,000 on depreciation and insurance alone. I don't care how efficient that new engine is, that's way too much money to recoup by getting 10 miles per gallon more than an old engine. So what's my message here? This isn't about me beating up on people buying new cars necessarily. It's about how making decisions without a long-term goal or a thought to the consequences can have you lose money left, right and centre. Who doesn't want a shiny new car? Who wouldn't prefer to spread the cost? Who wouldn't want the ease of monthly payments? 
but that convenience comes at a price. If you ask others to perform that service for you, they're going to want paying for the privilege. Remember that risk I mentioned earlier? They want compensating for that. You could owe them money for five years. That's a long time for something to go wrong. If it does, the car can't be sold to recoup all the money because the car ain't worth what you paid for it. So they make their money early on. They charge you 15,000 for a car that could be bought for cash for 13 and a half. They make 1,500 pound on you at the point of sale and that affords them the ability to lend you money for five years. And that insurance company, they see they're getting paid on monthly payments so they guess that you're paying for the car on monthly payment. And likely that you've got some 0% deals on furniture and TVs and such. So they want to protect themselves against you not running on the hamster's wheel for another year. What if you can't keep up to speed on this wheel of debt? It couldn't happen to you, you say. Has anybody ever lost a job? Ever had a health scare and was unable to carry on working? Ever worked for a company that went in another direction? Ever sent an email that they shouldn't have from work and got into trouble with HR? 12 months is a long time to stay out of trouble. So the insurance company takes 20% for covering their risk. Now I doubt I'm the first person to have ever said it, but money should come with a warning. So now that I've painted such a bleak and sinister picture of the world, that's it for this week. Just kidding, stay with me. Here's where I actually help you, not just frighten you. Yes, this picture is bleak, and it's true that many normal people live this way. Don't underestimate the power of denial. If I was in this situation, I'd deliberately not think about it either. And then each month would roll by and bad luck wouldn't strike and we'd be just fine. I even think I could sleep each night in that situation. I doubt it'd be a good sleep though. So how can I help you? Isn't this the way things happen? That's just a way of life, right? Wrong. Let's take car insurance. I don't drive a £15,000 brand new car. I drive a second hand one. Six years old with 100,000 miles on it. It looks identical to the 2014 model you can still buy today because the shape hasn't been changed. But it's worth every penny of the £6,000 I paid for it. It's no longer worth the 32000 that the first owner paid back in 2008. That's over 80% depreciation for anyone trying to do the math by the way. It still drives great, has no problems and looks fantastic. You've got to love the Germans in their cars. Now what's this got to do with car insurance you're thinking? Well, car insurance is based partly off the value of the car. If the car is damaged or stolen, the insurance company has to pay for a similar replacement. So my 6,000 versus a 32,000 pound car means a lower cost because it's less for them to pay out. Also, I didn't have to borrow money to buy a 32 grand car. I didn't choose to borrow to buy a 15 grand car. I paid outright. So I don't have a £500 or £250 per month, 0% interest free car payment. That means I can put aside £50 each month and at the end of the year pay for a £600 insurance policy with cash. I don't have to take the £60 a month option and then pay £720 in total. £600 up front or £720 over 12 months. See how there's another way? Now... I didn't get the bragging rights of a 14 plate reg and I didn't get that new car smell, you know, the the chemically toxic one, but I got a car that was a 32 grand new car just a few years ago. It's still a nicer vehicle than the 15,000 pound brand new vehicle we used in our example above. And it comes with lower insurance costs and less depreciation. Best of all, it doesn't cost me anything extra each month as I own it now. So that's the message for this episode then. Pay for things with your own money. Don't borrow someone else's. I know the message you thought I was telling you is that new cars are evil and lose all your money. That is a message, sure. You can have that one for free. But I see buying a new car as a symptom rather than a problem. If you're not thinking about the consequences and seeing the bigger picture, then I'm not surprised that poor decisions are being made. A new car is actually just a poor decision. And poor decisions tend to lead to more poor decisions, like getting car insurance monthly at 20% interest rate. The real problem is the bigger picture, or more importantly, the fact that you're not seeing it. What's the aim here? 
we want to spend as little as possible on the things we need to spend on. So we have as much as possible to achieve the things we want. And we want a lot of things. So we have to prioritise our wants and weigh them up against each other. I want a new car, but I want to be mortgage free. I want a new leather sofa, but I want to sleep well without worrying about owing so much money. I want a holiday to the Bahamas, but I don't want to retire broke. Prioritising these wants means we can achieve them all, just one by one, and maybe over a long period of time. It doesn't mean we don't get to have any of them. It may take us 30 years to save for retirement. It may take us 30 months to save for the Bahamas. It may take 30 weeks to save for that leather sofa. But we can do all of them together. If we borrow to achieve each of them, then the extra cost of doing that, that means we won't be able to do all of them. Because that extra cost comes from somewhere. It comes from your future money. So retiring broke starts to be a real possibility. Paying off that mortgage isn't guaranteed. And good luck sleeping worry-free over the next decade or two. Plan your spending each month. Allocate money towards the things you want to achieve. Set timescales you can afford and that you are happy with. Then see how many wants you have to forego. Pay out of your own savings for car insurance, home insurance, new mobile phones, better TVs, new furniture. Pay yourself a monthly amount into your car insurance fund to cover next year's premium, collecting a bit of bank interest on the way so that you don't have to borrow to pay for this year's policy. Put some money aside each month into a replacement fund so you can upgrade your TV occasionally or replace furniture when it's damaged or or fashions change. Be your own lender. You're the best bank manager I know because you don't want to rip you off. So take that with you, let it direct your spending plan. If you really can't make it month to month and you're buried in debt, then you need to see a free debt counsellor like Step Change or Citizens Vice or Christians Against Poverty. National Debt Helpline. If you're disorganised and you're paying the price for not controlling your spending, then a personal finance coach like me can get you back on track. If you've got lots of money but you don't make the most of your money, again, coaching can help. If you're savvy and love to hunt down a bargain, then this is a reminder for you. Keep the bigger picture in mind at all times. Now, ever since I introduced the idea of living by a spending plan, I've had something I needed to elaborate on. What do you do if you don't receive a regular income, like a salary or a predictable wage? What if you get commissions on top of a basic wage or are employed on a zero hours contract? How do you plan in those situations? Now, for this, I have an irregular spending plan. The concept is similar, but fundamentally different. We still list all of the things we need and would like to spend our money on. This time though, we put them in priority order. The order that they need to be done in for us to survive and to keep our sanity. So let me run an example to paint the picture a bit better here. If we received a thousand pound this month and everything on our list for the month was 2,500, where does the money go? And what do we not achieve? Well, putting things in order of priority means that we can go down the list until the money naturally runs out. Once it runs out, everything left on the list doesn't get done this month. So what's the priority? Firstly, look to protect the four basic fundamentals. Food, housing, utilities and transport. You need to stay fed. It might be beans on toast if things are really dire money-wise, but at least you're fed. In this case, we're looking at worst case, under earning. So let's say basic staple food and no luxuries. Then housing. Make sure the rent is paid or the mortgage stays current. Risking these in the short term can lead to losing the roof over your head in the long term. There may be room to ask a lender for a holiday payment, but if you anticipate having better months in the near future, it's best to sacrifice and push through it for now. So keep the home up to date and free of risk. Then make the home livable. Keep the lights on, the water flowing and run the heating enough to prevent hypothermia. 
You might want to wear two jumpers and some thermals in winter, but running the central heating occasionally will keep the house from going mouldy and stops everyone from freezing. Now transport. If you have to drive to work, you need to keep the car running. That means money for petrol, insurance, MOT, road tax. Drive more efficiently and do some DIY maintenance on it, but keep the car running so you can continue to earn. Now they're your necessities. They're the four fundamentals. Food, housing, utilities and transport. Everything else after this is a, a nice to have. TV packages, broadband, new clothes, mobile phone contracts, gym memberships. They all look unnecessary when you're faced with no income. You might need to replace the odd item of clothing or have a, a phone for work contact reasons. But there's plenty of scope to slash expenses out of your life here. Once that thousand pound runs out there's no money to do anymore you may have problems with lenders to come but at least the home is safe food is on plates lights are on and work can continue now if this is your life every month you've a tough road ahead your lifestyle is too expensive and your income is too low you need to earn more and slash costs take an extra work or look to change jobs if you can won't be easy but that situation is untenable long term. If this is your life occasionally though, we enter a different world altogether. It becomes a case of planning for irregularity, not for lack of income. This month may be a slow month. Next month may be a bumper month. Over the year we average out a decent money, but some months are really tight, others were flush. This is where prioritizing can really help. For instance, you work on commissions and receive £1,000 this month, but £5,000 next month. Monthly costs total the 2500 we had earlier. On average, we made enough to cover these. We made £3,000 on average. There was actually money to spare. So the principle is the same. Cover in order of priority. This month, we can only afford the basics. A few nice-to-haves, but absolutely no luxuries. Next month... With our bumper £5,000 pay, we play catch-up. We reinstate all the categories. That gym membership we couldn't afford, we make good. That money we couldn't afford to save for Christmas presents, we make good. In fact, once everything is made good, you could have £500 left over. Now this method works, but it's a roller coaster, right? I mean, absolutely, I agree. This would have me in panics one month, euphoria and dread the next. So how does a regular planning get around this? Here's what I'd do in this situation. I'd look to buy myself some breathing room, try to cut all my costs down for a few months to create some surplus cash, take a break from the TV packages, cancel it for a while even, swap to a pay-as-you-go phone deal to avoid high monthly contracts, eat cheaper foods than usual to lower the grocery bill, look for cheaper energy suppliers, have a garage sale or eBay some stuff. Why? To scratch together an average month's money. If you can put together an average month's money, in this case, 2,500, you can buy yourself breathing room. In reality, you could live one month ahead of your pay and iron out the fluctuations. Think about it. If you had a month's money in the bank, you could pay yourself and live a normal, comfortable month. If this month's money starts out and looks on track to be a bit low, you could start to make cutbacks now and have a slightly tighter month so that next month you top up the bad month. So two 1,750 months are better than a £1,000 month and a £2,500 month. If you have a great month and earn five grand, you can keep the extra money in the bank and continue to pay yourself the standard month's 2500 As more and more time goes by, you can build up this pot to be enough for two, three, six full months. Then that pot of cash can rarely be used to iron out the ups and downs of irregular income, to give you consistency, allow you to plan for the future, and take away that uncertainty and dread that came before. Now it could be hard to build that pot of cash initially, especially if there are low income months to begin with, but think again of the bigger picture. You can hold your hands up and do nothing, or you can start to push against it. Once you have a little float money set aside, you can at least begin to take out the sting of these bad months. In time, you could even eradicate the fluctuations completely. So that's the extreme version. 
of this episode's message. That's the second version. It's also the second version of my spending plan. Download a copy from the website, click resources on that top menu at sspf.co.uk. There's a regular spending plan for those of you on fixed income, and now the irregular spending plan for those with unpredictable or sporadic income. I want you to be in control of your financial world, regardless of your current financial status. Your financial picture should be bright and positive, not dreary and upsetting. An essential part of that control is not using other people's money to buy things. It's about having money of your own to do things with. It's about you being your own bank. Regular, irregular, low income, high income. Whether it's saving up for car insurance ahead of time or trying to get to a a month's living expenses and savings, we can all get to that place. And once you gain control, you'll gain consistency. Once you've got consistency, you'll get financial peace of mind. Then we can really plan a better future. Next, we'll be looking at living on less than you earn as a way of life. How keeping some money each month opens the door to financial freedom and is the key to your dreams. In the meantime, though, check out my blog at sspf.co.uk slash blog for more financial common sense. Don't forget to spread the word. Financial peace of mind is here to stay. Simple steps and my personal finance coaching are here to help. If you're finding this approach useful, but are unsure on how to act, drop me a line. See how personal finance coaching can help you. After all, what could be better than having personal guidance tailored to your circumstances? Thanks for listening. That's it for episode 5. For more information, check out sspf.co.uk for show notes and transcripts of each episode. This podcast is copyrighted Simple Steps Personal Finance Limited and can be shared freely. The SSPF podcast is available as direct download on Android, RSS, iTunes, Stitcher, YouTube, Vimeo, Dailymotion and more. We're here however you want us. If you like what you're hearing, please leave a review so others know to listen in. Thanks as always to Partners in Line for the music used throughout this episode. See you next time.